Art. What is art? What is science? Well, I'm not going to stand here and pretend that I can answer these questions. But I want to share with you my story of how I fell in love with them. After I realized that I had something in common with both. As a kid, I was very curious. And uh, whenever something was prohibited, gosh, that was like a magnet for me. If they told me that I shouldn't have done something, I first thought, well, who says? Why? And they got me in trouble just about all the time. And I had a special preference for dismantling things, never putting them back together, especially appliances, things like that. And uh, as an adult, I had uh, the great fortune of a really rich life. I, I was a graduate student going to UCLA, I looked for a room for rent, and I found a room in a house with the family. And she was an artist, a great artist. And uh, I learned from her and from all her friends that were artists that uh, what was uh, once a flaw of mine, gosh, I'm so curious and so disobedient and I was getting in trouble. Well, it could have been an asset, right? So my biological mother growing up used to say, gosh, you're so disobedient. Why don't you behave? And I always was in trouble, always. And I thought, gosh, what's wrong with me? You know, I'm, I just want to find out more things. I'm always looking for the next thing. I always have this thirst, insatiable thirst, to learn something I don't know and push it to the limit, find out what people don't know. Well, curiously, I met a bunch of artists that orbited around this house, and one of them was June Wayne, terrific artist. She taught me that the essence of being original was curiosity was asking yourself these questions and identify the things that other people hadn't asked and answered before. And we look at people. They are innovators. We look up to them with admiration. Those who could be technologists with a new invention or scientists with a new discovery or artists with a great new concept. And we look up to them and sometimes we forget, myself included, sometimes we forget that for each one that succeeds, and we look up to, there are hundreds that failed, but deserve the same credit for having tried, for being curious and asking that question. And June Wayne, who was this terrific artist, kept reminding me to keep, uh, keep asking that question. Ask yourself the next question and find out what people haven't asked before. Because if you just ask yourself questions and you don't identify what's missing, then what you do, you stop at the moment which is the most important one. And she used to say, the curiosity is in such dire supply. Probably this is because people sometimes feel shy about asking the next question. You know, and as a kid, I was typically, you know, punished for asking all these questions, pestering all the adults and asking them, why, why, how does it work? I want to do that, can I try, can you teach me? I want to learn. And at some point, you know, people get worn out, I guess. Well, I will do it right now too, so I understand it now, but as a kid, I was totally insatiable about this, and I'll always get in trouble. And then I go, as an adult, I go to graduate school, and I go on to my life as a scientist. I'm training as a scientist. And I am, as a scientist, you have to undergo a certain very formal training with rules. You need to obey certain rules to make sure it's science. But then you need to ask the questions that people haven't asked before. Otherwise, you're not a scientist. You're just repeating something that somebody else has done. You need to come up with a new idea with a new concept, new theory, and an experiment to demonstrate whether that works or not. So, as a scientist, I started asking these questions, but luckily enough, I, uh, I had a professor in college that taught me something very important that his professor taught him, which was by the time I graduate, I better teach him something. I, I cannot just take his inspiration and go pay it forward to others, but I need to pay back a little bit to him. And uh, later on, when I became a professor myself, I had my students, and I'll tell you a story in a minute. So going back to this adopted family with this artist who was brilliant, her name was Chana Horowitz. And she used to come over my shoulder when I was working on the table, my computer working on some results, and I had these pictures of bubbles that I loved. They're so unpredictable and so cute, and you never know where they're going to go, right? And I just love photographing them and putting these pictures in my papers. And one day I'm doing my calculations for all these gases that are inside the bubbles. And she comes over my shoulder and she says, what are you doing? Oh, what are those bubbles? Why, well, you know, this gas goes out. Okay. 
And there's this theory that I really don't buy. So I designed an experiment to demonstrate that that theory wasn't working. But I have an alternate theory, and I designed an experiment to show that my theory is working. She looked at me with pride, and she said, gosh, you're so disobedient. And all of a sudden, what used to be my biggest flaw became an asset. Then I realized, gosh, being disobedient, yes, you go through the formal training, and then you break the rule, or you break the paradigm, so to speak. So I thought, gosh, that's not so bad. I think I can do this. Disobedience for a living, well, that's, that's pretty good. So I went on and became a professor, and China, a famous artist, that will go to see her shows, and she'll introduce me to everyone, and she will say, oh, this is my son. He studies bubbles. And I was like a, you know, an adopted son. And the funny thing is that she will tell everyone that I was her son. And then people will say, wait a second, you're American. How come he has an accent? And, she, and with a straight face, she always tell them, actually, he has a very serious medical condition. Every time he gets a cold, he develops this Italian accent. <laughs> it was rather unbelievable, with a straight face, at her own shows, like in a big museum. And people just, OK. That's what I learned from her. Be disobedient. Don't limit yourself of being too serious. And I always, I tended to err on the serious side. You know, science is a very serious business. I'm not giving you a scientific talk today, so I take some liberties. But I realized one thing. You know, this concept of inspiration, they inspire me to always be playful with my mind and to take it to the next level. So I put together one and one. So this idea of curiosity, disobedience as the root of originality and what my professor had taught me. So going to my love for bubbles, what inspired me to become a scientist and study them? Well, one day I walk into a class. I was doing a year abroad. I walk into a class, and uh, this professor was really nice. And I asked him, can I work in your lab? Sure, you can work in my lab. And I ended up working with him for eight years. He was really the nicest guy. And uh, he's still a professor at UCLA. His name is Mike Stenstrom. And uh, he taught me right away, he said, you know, by the time you graduate, you need to tell me something. You need to teach me something back, okay? And then you can go on your own and teach other people. And so I thought, okay, well, I mean, I want to study my bubbles, take pictures of them. Oh, my gosh, I took hundreds of pictures, thousands. I just love them. I was stand like until 10 o'clock in the evening taking pictures on this tank with a window. Really, I really love them. And then one day, I guess I must have taught him something because I graduated. I became a professor in my own right. And... Uh, one student comes to my office hours without, um, I, I, I didn't know who the student was. He wasn't even taking my class. And he said, hi, professor. My name is Mac Akash, and I'm not taking your class. But I read your papers. And right away, I thought, gosh, he's the one. And I said, I read your papers. And uh, are you sure that these greenhouse gases that you talk about, are you sure that some of them are negligible? And I thought, gosh, what a nerve. He's not even taking my class. <laughs> <laughs> And he's telling me that something is wrong with my paper. I thought, well, maybe I'll teach him something. I'll show him. So I turn, I look, and there's a recycling bin next to my desk. I pick up an envelope, and on the proverbial back of the envelope, I said, let's do a calculation. We multiply this by this, and we add up this and this. And this is the result. And at some point, I stop, and I said, I think I made a mistake. Let me retry it. So I put down the envelope. I picked up another envelope, back of the envelope. I did the calculation. At the third time around, that gave me great pause. And I said, you know, I think you're right. <laughs> do you do research in any lab? And he said, no, actually, I was thinking that to work in your lab. Do you have an opening? And I thought, yeah, now I do. <laughs> so <laughs> it worked for me for the rest of the year, OK? And what happened is uh, he went on to be a great graduate student at Berkeley. And he taught me something. And in that moment, I learned something from him, and I had yet to teach him anything. So I was already in debt with him. So I figured that I better, you know, better deliver. So I, the, rest of the, the rest of the year I taught him, and then he went on to have a great career. And that moment I realized one thing, that what my professor's professor, John Andrews, a very famous guy, what I, he had taught him, and he in turn taught me, I have learned back from the student. He taught me something. And I realized that it came like full circle. And this reminded me of one thing that happened before in my life. And everything kind of went together. In this very moment, when Akash challenged me with this question, 
I went to the University of Padua, which is a university very, very ancient. You know, since the 1200s, countless people graduated in the same room. And you go there, and the very famous people who graduated there uh, gave a fresco on the wall. It's called The Notables of Padua. And I was defending my thesis, presenting it to my committee. And at some point, uh, I paused a second, I looked up. And one of the frescoes, the one right in front of me, was this interesting fellow with a distinguished look. And the name said, Nicolaus Copernicus. I felt very, very little. Gosh, like, it was Copernicus and four or five other people, equally as famous, and me. Like, who was I to be in that room with them? That was like a big deal of responsibility. And I thought, gosh, he must have taught something to his professor, who was a rather famous guy. And he went on to inspire many other people to be scientists. But I felt so little in that moment. And I thought, gosh, I look at Copernicus, and I look at this student he's teaching me, well, I'm not going to leave the mark as Copernicus. They're not going to study my bubble papers in 500 years, okay? But I will feel very accomplished even if I didn't put a tile on the mosaic of knowledge. But just I cleaned up the dust so somebody else can come and put the tile right there. In that moment, I felt like, gosh, yeah, right now I'm a scientist. Thank you very much.